then we turn to our solid mechanics, and we turn to who remembers more circles from solid mechanics. I don't see too many hands going up. Right? So we'll, we'll review them, and we can develop some very simple failure models just based on what we can learn or what we, what we already know from more circles. Okay, So let's imagine we have a body that's under some force, some load. And we're gonna we're gonna cut that body. We're gonna cut it. So now we have sort of this type of thing. We're gonna place a coordinate axis on it. We're gonna use the coordinate axis that is the principal stresses. So we can choose any coordinate axis we want. We're going to choose to use the principal stress axis. So what's special about the principal stress axis? In terms of the way the stress tensor looks. Yeah, I mean, there's only three. Another way to, you know, another way to say it, there's no shear, right? In that axis, there's no shear. It's all normal stresses. Now, since our body was over here under some loading, there's going to be some traction vector associated with this. There's going to be some traction vector associated with that cut I made. Right? And there's going to be some normal vector associated with the surface. Right? So. The normal vector is just normal to the surface. And then there's some traction vector that has to be there because I cut the body in half. right? And it was in equilibrium before. So we have a formula for you know, the, the, the traction. This is called the Cauchy stress equation. Remember that. We have a formula. So the traction is equal to the stress times the normal, OK? And we know our stress because we chose our coordinate system to be the principal stress system. The only three stresses are the principal stresses. Right? So our stresses are sigma 1, sigma 2, Sigma 3, and we're going to multiply that by the components of the normal vector, right? So n1, n2, n3, right? So these are essentially the components of the normal vector in the principal stress axis. Right? So that's equal to, that's equal to sigma 1 n1, sigma 2 n2, sigma 3 n3. Okay. Now, what if I want to know the, the component of the traction in the normal direction. So I know that I know the traction vector now. Traction vector is this. I want to know the component of that in the in the direction of n or the projection of t in n. What is that? T dot n. It's the dot product there. So T dot n will give me the component. That's a scalar thing, right? The component of the traction in the normal direction. And so that's sigma 1 n1 squared plus sigma 2 n2 squared plus sigma 3 
N3 squared, right? And I'm going to call it, so I'm, that's just an equation, right? So I have that Tn is equal to this. That's an equation. And I'm going to call that equation 1. We're going to use that in a little bit. So what if I want to know the magnitude, well, what if, let's just start and say, what if I want to know the magnitude of T? What's the magnitude of the vector T? It's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, right? So it would be you know, the magnitude of T would be equal to Tn squared plus Ts squared. So, that, so I'm just going to take the square of both sides, right? So, and I, so then I just have t squared is equal to, I'm just get rid of that square root sign. I don't like square roots in my equation. Right. So I, I guess uh, should that's the magnitude of the the magnitude of the vector t is equal to this. Uh, and then, so this is not a vector. This is just the magnitude of t squared. It's a scale. Well, what do we know about t s? What do we know about t s in this coordinate system? Zero. There's no shear. Right. This will be the magnitude of the shear stress. Right? There's no shear. So this will be 0. And so then I just have that t squared is equal to tn squared. So And then the last thing, so this is the second equation. And then I'm going to have the third, my, uh, a third equation is that you know n is a unit vector. And so the magnitude of a unit vector is equal to 1, right? And so that is equal to n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right here. Yeah. So so then I have three equations. I'm just going to write them in matrix form. So, I mean, you can think of this just like A x equal to B, right? What's the solution to A x equal to B? X is equal to what? A inverse B, right? 
So I'm not going to actually take the inverse of that, although it's not that hard. You, do you know, just as an aside, do you know how you, if you, get, if you have a matrix, given what you know in this class, you actually know enough to be able to take the inverse of this thing without a calculator or a computer. You know how to do that? So basically what you would do, all you, if you wanted to know what A inverse is, you set up a set of, you know, you, so you, 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 you'd write A in there. I'm not going to rewrite it. And then you augment that with the identity matrix. Like that. And then you just do your row operations. And put the, so you, do, you start doing your row operations to put A in reduced row echelon form. And after all your row echelon, after all your row operations were complete, so that this now looks like the identity matrix, then whatever would be here would be A inverse. So I'm not going to go through it, but that's how you do it. So it's not that hard. So you can say after row operations, this would be So if you ever find yourself in the middle of the desert and need to take an inverse, you know, where, you, where, you, where you don't have a computer, obviously. <laughs> you know how. All right, so if you actually did solve that system of equations, you'd get this. You get that squared squared, okay. And then, given what we know, remember the principal stresses have a particular order. Sigma one is greater than sigma two is greater than sigma three. And so, given that ordering, we can actually make the determination that this thing is always greater than zero. This thing is always less than zero, and this thing is always greater than or equal to zero. Right. Yeah. No, it should be one minus three. Well, I'm sorry, one minus two. Sorry. So, <clears throat> okay, so now we have some inequalities, and in each of the in each case we're going to multiply by the denominator 
to clear it out, right? So if I, if I multiply both sides of this, equa this inequality by the denominator, then I get rid of it. Right? So I clear it out. And then I'm going to add, I'm going to add 1 half sigma 2 minus sigma 3. And that'll be clear y in a second. But right, so if I have an equation or an inequality, I don't change it as long as I perform the operation on both sides. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the denominator, and I'm going to add that thing to both sides. And so if I do that, after some rearranging, what I get is So I should say, I'm going to add this to the first equation, and when I add to the second equation, it'll be a little, it'll be a little bit different. But anyway, yeah. So the denominator the denominator will always be negative, right? denominator will always be negative. So what, what about the numerator? I'm trying to think. Um, I think you have to multiply out those terms on the top, and then you'll see that I'm not seeing the exact argument right now. I'll, I'll answer it for you next time. But I, I know that's right. Let me think about it. And I'll, I'm not seeing exactly the argument. But. So t sub n would always be what? No, no. No. It, T sub n is going to be somewhere between sigma 1 and sigma 3. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's. Yeah, so T sub n is going to be always greater than sigma 3. So that first term would be positive, And it's always going to be less than sigma 1. So that would always be negative. see. Yeah. Let me just move on. I'll, I'll answer for you next time. I'm not seeing the exact argument. I'm getting, cause that, it looks like you'd have a negative over negative, which would imply it's positive, but I'm trying to think. Maybe. Okay, well, just clear. Okay, clear, you can clear out the denominator, right? Clear it out. Just get rid of it. So then you just look at the, the numerator. 
And I think in that case, then it's then you then you always have a negative number because Tn is always greater than sigma three, which means that term would be negative, and it's always less than sigma one. Yeah. Now you do have to flip the sign if it's negative. Then. Well, anyway, uh, let me think about it. I'll I'll, figure, I'll come back and explain it next time. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> we, if if you do what I said, then we the first the first equation inequality becomes this thing, right? Well. What if I just, you know, this looks kind of complicated, but if we just look at, you know, if we call this x and T S Y and this R, or in other words, you know, x squared, y squared, r squared, then you can see that that's just an <coughs> equation of a circle. Right? And so then there's two more. So you see in the second two, I added not this term, but that one to both sides. <clears throat> so I, on this one, on the first one I added that, 2 minus 3. Here I added 1 minus 3, 1 minus 2. Okay. So I have basically the equation of three circles, which if you were to plot them on the Tn, and of course, sometimes you'll see this is just written sigma n versus ts. And of course, sometimes you'll see this written as tau. In other words, the normal stress, shear stress plane. Then you have three circles where you have sigma 3. I'm sorry, you have sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 1. Remember the principal stresses. There's no, there's no shear in that. Where the principal stresses are is only on the normal stress axis. There's no shear. So then I have these three intersects here that form the three circles. One, two, and three. And the state of stress will always be in this region due to those inequalities. <clears throat> and I actually have a little demo. So, so up there I have a stress tensor. Okay. So this box is like my little characteristic cube. Okay. That's under the this little characteristic cube is under the stress implied by the values of the stress tensor. And they're here. They're just on a slider bar. They're just some numbers. It doesn't really matter what they are. Okay. They're, <coughs> probably numbers that go from 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1 or something. So those are my six unique entries of the stress tensor. And here's my cube. And this plane represents where I'm cutting that cube. Okay. The black dot represents, uh, or the black line represents the, the normal, um, and the green lines are the, the shear and normal components of the traction vector. Okay. <coughs> 
but the but the point is, from this from this stress and this cut. This, so here I can rotate the cutting plane around, so I can cut I can cut my cube arbitrarily, and there I can change my stress arbitrarily. And these are the more circles that are generated. You know, forget below the axis; it doesn't matter. Uh, but these are the more circles that are generated, and that block, black dot represents the state of stress <coughs> in, that, in this representation. And so what you'll see is as I move things around, the, 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 the principal stresses will change, the shape of the circles, everything will change, but the black dot will always be in that shaded region there. <coughs> so... So the principal stresses are moving around, which changes the shape of the circles. Um, let's see if I can. So if I if I make a scenario where there's no shear stress. So the, in that so in that case, uh, I'm just changing the stress, but then also I can change the plane, my cutting plane, to be anything. Black dots always inside the circles. All right, so little demo. So the last point I. I want to make, and it'll it'll be a good place to stop. Is that let's say we go to the lab, let's say we go to the lab, and we do a uniaxial tension test until it fails, until the sample fails. So I pull on it with some wire. Many, many, many materials will fail along a plane like that. It won't, it won't just break in half. It'll, it'll, it'll fail along this angular plane. Okay? So there must be something special about that, about that plane. So if originally I have, if I have my, uh, you know, axis, say, x1, x2, and I rotate, I do a rotation about an angle beta to say x1 prime, x2 prime, then the rotation matrix associated with that, and we could derive it like we've derived other rotation matrices, but it's, I just got one more minute, bear with me. The rotation matrix is like this. So if I were to take the state of stress, which the state of stress in this case is just y, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, like that, and I rotate it into my primed axis so that I have y prime equals r, 0, r, t, that would imply if I look at the 1, 1 component, I have y cosine beta and y, 1, 2 is y over 2 cosine beta sine beta, which equals to y over 2 sine 2 beta, okay? This expression right here is at a maximum when beta is equal to 45 degrees. Right? Well, it turns out that we often observe in the laboratory that the material will fail along a plane that's 45 degrees. So there's something special about the way materials fail on this 45 degree plane. It's not a coincidence that the shear stress is at a maximum 
at the 45 degree plane. So this, this gives us some idea that maybe materials fail based on some maximum shear stress criteria. Okay? And it turns out, and this is what we'll look at next time, is that we can use the more circles to construct a maximum shear stress criteria. And then we can determine how rocks will fail.